I'm Kay Taylor, and I'm the Director of Education at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, and I want to thank you guys for joining us tonight. We're here for a Pass the Torch lecture, and we're very proud of our Pass the Torch series because it's an opportunity for Space Camp, but also the community to come in and hear from people with great ideas, great stories, and, and great ways to inspire us about um, Huntsville's history, the history of space exploration, the future of space exploration, and tonight is no exception. Now, everyone in this room probably knows and understands who our speaker is tonight. But I'm going to ask a little quiz. Can anyone in space camp tell me who Mr. Ed Buckby is? I see some hands go up. Yes, ma'am. He's the man who began. He is the founder of Space Camp. So for you guys, you're getting to have the week of your life because of our speaker tonight. But he's done a few other things. Now, in my mind, that may be the greatest thing he ever did. But let me just tell you, Mr. Ed Buckby is an author. He is a lecturer. And for many, many years, he has been a passionate promoter of space space science, space exploration. He was the first director of the U.S. Space and Rocket Center here. So he was the first boss here. He did, in fact, found Space Camp. He was also Werner von Braun's public affairs officer when Dr. von Braun was in charge of NASA. How about that? He worked with Dr. Von Braun. And he also knew for many, many years the people who made spaceflight possible, from the engineers and the technicians to the astronauts themselves to the policymakers. And now for you, the next generation of engineers, astronauts, technicians and policymakers. He knew the original Mercury 7 astronauts and the original 12 humans who walked on the moon. And it is his experience with those amazing individuals that he's here to talk about tonight. Now he's here because we have now the second edition of The Real Space Cowboys. And this was the book Mr. Buckby wrote about those early astronauts who did historic feats. And he's since gone back, and he's thought about it, and he's come up with more information and more great stories and, a, and a, giving us a better picture of that historic time. For any of us who are interested in space exploration, this is kind of required reading in my book. And he's here to talk about this tonight. And at the end of our, our talk, Mr. Buckby is going to be upstairs signing copies of the new edition. So Space Camp, get your thinking hats on. He's got some great stuff for you tonight. And you're going to have an opportunity to ask a few questions at the end of the presentation. And then at the end of our Q&A, um, Mr. Buckby will be signing books, and I encourage you all to attend. So, without further ado, folks, this is the man who invented Space Camp and did a few other things in the meantime, Mr. Ed Buckby. Uh, thank you very much for those kind words, Kay. I have to uh, remind myself that uh, I was in your seat several times. In fact, I got to go to camp every day, almost, for 24 years. So I was in space camp very early, enjoying all what you guys and gals are going to be joining, uh, enjoying this week. I'm going to talk about the, uh, the real space cowboys. Uh, these were the early astronauts that I worked with, and, and you, I'm sure, heard about them. But this is an interesting group of guys. And I'm going to talk a, about some of those missions. And I worked on uh, about 32 missions of the astronauts, and you look at this, chart and that's the flight patches for the astronauts 
uh, 44 of them, uh, beginning with flights in 1961 and all the way through 1975. And that's when this country was very much engaged in space travel, manned space travel, not only uh, into Earth orbit, but also to the moon. Uh, Alan Shepard on the left and Wally Sherrard on the right were the two guys I work with the most. And uh, I could tell you uh, stories that uh, would keep you probably awake for several hours about these two guys because they were special. Uh, they were uh, originally fighter pilots and we made them astronauts and nobody really had a, a schedule for astronauts. And we kind of made up our, our, uh, what it was to be an astronaut as we went along because there was really no real standard for what an astronaut will do. So we found out real quickly. This book uh, is that story about those astronauts. In fact, there's a DVD in there that you will see some of those visuals tonight. And many of those visuals have never been seen before because they were given to me by astronauts who flew the missions. And you'll have a chance to hear some of the comments and see the real guys working on things like walking in space and, and also uh, walking on the moon. I don't have to remind you now that you've been through space camp. This country was shocked about 1957 when a thing called Sputnik went into space. I was in school at the time. I thought it was a potato because I did not ever hear the word Sputnik, but I had heard about potatoes. We've, we called our scientists uh, astronaut and found out that the, the Russians had truly launched a satellite into Earth orbit. That was the beginning of the space race. We in Huntsville, Alabama developed that rocket called Explorer 1, and on top of that rocket, that Redstone rocket, is the first satellite that we launched, Explorer 1. So we were truly engaged with the Russians in space travel. And lo and behold, President Eisenhower decided we need astronauts. And you're looking at the, the wildest looking group of people that probably has ever been photographed. Uh, we're talking about very cocky, egotistical, uh, fighter pilots who believe they could do anything. And why did they join? They wanted to go higher, faster, and farther. So they became an astronaut. We have C Carpenter, we have uh, Cooper, Glenn Grissom, Shara, Shepard, and Slayton. We kind of abbrevi abbreviated them. We have CC, GG, and SSS. And you'll notice that's the order they stand up when they make any presentations in the public eye. We finally taught them that's what they had to do. Now, we had what was called the coming out party for these seven astronauts. We brought them to Washington, D.C. I think this is the first time that any of them have ever had a coat and tie on in their life. And the, uh, the press people went crazy. They're crawling around on the floor, standing up on tables and chairs, trying to get pictures. And they ask questions like, do you think you'll get back from space alive? That seemed to be the most interesting subject to talk about is whether or not these guys were going to survive. And of course, somebody said, well, who's going to be first? Well, you see all of them their, uh, held up their hands. In fact, Wally's got two hands up about, I want to be the first astronaut to fly. And you never knew what they were going to do. Here we were trying to be very pro you know, professional and line them up perfectly. And of course, they started making signals and signs and so forth and sticking their head out in front of the camera. This was the family portrait. We we worked months and months to get this picture because we had never had them all suited up in what we thought was the regular suiting process and having them in real space suits. Well, it turns out all six of these suits are rejects. Those are combat boots that we sprayed with silver paint. These are hoses hanging down from the back of the suits because none of the zippers work. Wally had the only real space suit on because he was in charge of spacesuits. So you get an idea of what we're dealing with. And Shepard said, I love this picture because I'm the tallest guy in the picture. Well, no wonder he's standing on a bench. So this is the kind of situation we, <clears throat> we found ourselves with as we dealt with these astronauts. I gotta tell you, <clears throat> these guys survived the most complicated medical examinations that we've ever experienced. And that's a doctor. And by the way, the astronauts did not call them doctors. They called them the medical cult because this guy could say to John, yes, you can fly in space. No, you can fly in space. 
So they were really the conquerors of their future. And this doctor has just poured hot water in John's ear, and now he's pouring cold water on, in this ear. Now we have nothing, we have no idea what that has to do with space travel, but that's the kind of examination they went through. And John came out of that examination. He said, you know what? That doctor found openings on my body I did not know I had. And the other thing they went through was unbelievable amount of vibration and being dropped from high elevations. And it, it really was a struggle for us to figure out what this was, why was this being done to these men? Because they were not really going to be dropped, we didn't think, or shook or whatever. But anyway, again, this was the early days of preparing the Mercury astronauts for space travel. Have you ever heard of a centrifuge? You know what that is? It goes round and round in a room extremely fast. These gentlemen would go up there twice a month at Johnsville, Pennsylvania. And the reason they had that sign hung up above it was a lot of them thought the machine was going to completely dis dis disintegrate and go out through the buildings and they wanted people to know where to bring it back. These guys went through 16 Gs, guys and gals. Every time they ended up in Johnsonville, Pennsylvania, they did not leave there until they had gone through a 16G performance in that centrifuge. Again, uh, this was the preparation for them to fly because in those days we did not really know what were going to be the situations on these guys when they flew in space. So we, we really over-prepared them. We sent them out to the desert to practice survival. We dropped them in the ocean. Uh, we took them to the jungle primarily to teach them how to survive in case the spacecraft came back in an uninhabited area. It didn't take them long to show up in Huntsville, Alabama. Why? This guy right here, the rocket man. The astronauts liked to get close to the guy preparing the ride, whether it was an airplane or a spaceship. And that's why they showed up to meet Warner and Brown, because he was going to be flying, uh, he was going to be building the machine they were going to be flying. So we saw a lot of the uh, Mercury astronauts in the early 60s. Chimpanzees, monkeys, I can tell you right now, I have never heard an astronaut have any kind words for a monkey or a primate. You know why? The monkeys got all the rides in the early years. And so the astronauts had to sit on the sideline and watch these monkeys go into space and be cheered and, and honored and so forth before they ever got to fly. So they were not very kind. Uh, there was one monkey that the doctors loved. His name was Enos. Enos had just been returned from a flight and the doctors wanted to show him off to the press. So Shara and, and Shara and, and Car I mean, uh, Shepard are at the Cape. And they heard about this press conference they were going to have where Enos was going to be brought in and, uh, you know, shown to the press and Enos would be, they would read off his accomplishments and so forth. So they brought Enos in and they went through all the process of what Enos's mission was like. And as, as soon as the doctors got finished and stood Enos up, he rips off his diaper in front of the entire audience. And Shepard says, to Shara, you're next. This was not a good day at the Cape. This was a, a flight of a Mercury, uh, with a, Merc a Redstone Mercury. We did not have an astronaut, we did have monkeys on board, but basically it was a test flight. It did not work well, and consequently Von Braun decided we're gonna delay Shepard's flight on the Mercury Redstone. You know what happened? The Russians beat us again. They had beat us with dogs, with all sorts of satellites, and now they had launched Yuri Gagarin. By the way, that's today, right? April the 12th? Uh, and that was the time that we really realized that we were in some serious competition with the Russians when they, when they put Yuri Gagarin up. We got Shepard ready, May 5, 1961, and that, by the way, is, that's what he was inside of. That's right outside the door. If you haven't seen it, you gotta look at that. Those guys spent hours in that simulator. We call it the switchology machine because it has no computers, no motion, but basically switch the 
the button on, the light comes on, switch the button off, the light goes off. They spent literally hours in that machine practicing what they would end up doing on their mission. So uh, that was the thing that Shepard had been in. And you see those instrument panels area, switches, knees are right here. Uh, John put a sign in there, no handball playing in this area. And you never knew what those astronauts were going to put under the seat before they lifted off. There was always messages and things that we weren't expecting to find in the spacecraft. That was one of the things the astronauts enjoyed. So we had liftoff, May 5, 1961. And we, we lift off with Shepard in that rocket. And that was the beginning of manned space flight for this country. This young president, Jack Kennedy, was so impressed with what had happened that he brought Shepard and the entire Mercury family to the White House. Here we and go. Therefore, I want to uh, again express my congratulations uh, to Alan Shepard. Uh, we're uh, very proud of him. And I speak on behalf of uh, the Vice President, who is Chairman of our Space Council and who bears great responsibilities in this field, the members of the House and Senate Space Committee who are with us today, and uh, this decoration, which has gone from the ground up here. Yeah. <laughs> With only 15 minutes of space light under our belt, that young president challenged this nation. Here we go. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. And there's a target, Luna, the moon, 240,000 miles away. That was where we're headed for. We had John fly uh, in Earth orbit. Uh, he was our first American to orbit the Earth. Uh, he showed up in Huntsville frequently after his mission. And you probably don't know this, but John Glenn was, ran for president and did not get the nomination. But he became a US senator from Ohio. And he had a great interest in what we did here with Space Camp and all of our uh, rocketry programs and so forth. And we lost him a couple years ago. He was the last Mercury astronaut uh, in the family, and he was the one that we, uh, we, we spent a lot of time with. So we've, we've lost all seven of the Mercury astronauts. After Mercury, we started flying Gemini, and that's kind of a program that's been forgotten. Uh, th this was the first time we did a walk in space. Ed White did that from a Gemini program. They loved that spacecraft. You know why? It had two seats, just like in a cockpit of an airplane. They had a window, they had a control stick, and the astronauts loved the Gemini program because it was such a vehicle similar to what they had flown in, in high-performance jets. Here we go. Sitting atop 100 tons of explosive liquid fuel, Wally Shira proves unbelievably cool when his Titan rocket fails. Oxidizer pressure is down to about 32. Okay, Titan rocket is ready. Okay, no problem on these tanks? Okay, we're just sitting here breathing. We're just sitting here breathing. And that's basically what those astronauts were prepared to do. They knew what they were, were supposed to do. John, normally, Wally would have hit the, what we call the chicken switch, was an ejection system to pop him off that rocket. But he had flown before, and he knew what it was like to lift off. And he did not feel it in the seat of his pants. And that's why he didn't eject, because he knew the vehicle did not lift off. Typical astronaut with a lot of experience in flight. They enjoyed flying up there side by side 17,500 miles an hour, feet apart. And that Gemini program was fun. And of course, Wally had to put a little sign up in the window since he was a naval aviator and they were playing a football game that weekend against Army, guess what? He put a sign up saying, beat Army. This was the coming out party for the Mercury astronauts when they moved to Houston. They were not pleased, I might add, to be moving to Houston, Texas. But Lyndon Johnson decided that's where he wanted him. So again, CC, GG, SSS are all lined up. They're, on, they're honorary Texans. And they were made honorary Texas Rangers. Why? Well, they all drove Corvettes, except John. John drove a Hudson. So I asked Wally, 
I said, what are you showing uh, Alan Shepard and what are you saying to Alan? He said, I said, guess what, Alan? No more speeding tickets in Texas. And ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you, they use those Texas Ranger certificates because they all drove, except John, drove Corvettes. And they love those flat, straight roads in Texas, and they certainly tested their vehicles. This was a huge day, ladies and gentlemen, for Huntsville, Alabama. That young president, Jack Kennedy, made a trip to Huntsville. Why? He asked the question in Washington, are we going to beat the Russians to the moon? He couldn't get an answer. That's why he came here to meet this man, Warner Van Brown. Here we are in the limousine going over to the test site. I'm in the car right over here with Secret Service people, and we spent two weeks together. We're going down now to watch a launch, uh, I'm sorry, a test firing, ground test firing. And this was the first time this young president had ever been near a rocket. And we gave him a, a real live and firing presentation that day. And he really was impressed. He grabbed Von Brown's hand. He says, Mr. Dr. President, Dr. Von Brown, that's the most impressive experience I've ever seen. That powerful rocket that you built. I, I believe we can really go to the moon with that. And we showed him that day uh, our rockets, but we did not quite have the moon rocket ready for his trip. But later, he, 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 was, he knew that we were building it. And unbeknownst to us at, at my level, the Russians were building this monster called the N1. And this was their moon rocket. That thing had like 32 engines on the base, uh, 50 feet in diameter, over 400 feet in length. That was their moon rocket that flew four times unmanned, failed every time, they basically shut down their program. We did not know that in the 67, 68 time frame. We did not know that the Russians had basically shut down. This is a, a ground test firing. We used to do this about once a week in Huntsville, Alabama, and here we go. That's a Saturn V moon rocket booster. Uh, we're firing that thing before we fly it. Every booster was tested first. That thing is generating 160 million horsepower. That's like a string of automobiles from Seattle, Washington, all the way across the U.S. to New York City with accelerators all the way to the floor. The most powerful machine that we've ever built that we could control, and that's the Saturn V moon rocket. And you see those engines there. You know, in the minute, you'll, the second you'll see them begin to gimbal, that's how we controlled that machine. And we did that in Huntsville at least once a week in the 60s when we were building that big Saturn V. You get an idea of the power of that machine ended up taking our astronauts to the moon. We had flown 16 astronauts, not a scratch on them. We got three guys buttoned up in a spacecraft at the Cape. We have a fire, and we lose three astronauts. And ladies and gentlemen, that brought NASA to its knees. Many of us thought the program was never going to happen. We'd never see a, a launch of a rocket. And it was a sad, sad day because to lose three astronauts, not even in flight. It took about 18 months, but Von Braun and others came together and said, we can fix this. And they did, and we went back to flying. And Wally, my buddy, made the first flight on a Saturn 1B booster, and he's just being congratulated by Von Braun as being a very successful flight. So we're back in space uh, on our way to the moon. You could not go anywhere in a building and not see signs like this, late to bed, early to rise, work like heck, and advertise. You go down to the water fountain, and by the way, that's where all the major decisions were made, at the water fountain. You would hear three words, man, moon, decade. There was a passion about what we did and why we had a mission, and we knew we were challenged to beat the Russians to the moon. I got that big Saturn V ready to go, and that was something to see. Ten, nine. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on five, four, three, two. All engines running. It comes off the pad very slow, <clears throat> but you're looking at a seven and a half million pound thrust. We're about three miles away from that bird. We're staying at the press site. This was one of the nine flights to the moon. Lunch commenced. Liftoff. We have liftoff 49 minutes past the hour.
I got about three and a half G's during those flights. Not heavy on G, not G forces are not too heavy. We're gonna see separation here in a moment. And we can see some of that from ground level. Second stage separation. Houston, you're go for TLI. In Houston, you're go for TLI. We looked at each other and said, what does that mean, TLI? That means translunar insertion. That means you're going to the moon. And that was the first time we heard that call uh, from a liftoff at the Cape. Von Braun was always uh, involved in the blockhouse at the Cape. He was the guy who gave the final word to go or no go with the shuttle pro I'm sorry, the Saturn program. And he was there uh, for those missions. And we got ready for Apollo 11, Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin. Uh, a lot of people thought that we'll probably have a, a flag off, a wave off. We'll no, never land the first crew. Not true. We did land the first crew. Here we go. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. Eagle has landed. You're going to see Neil come down the ladder. I'm going to step off the land now. There he is. That's one small step for man. He wrote those words, by the way. July 20, 1969, we did land on the moon and we did beat the Russians to the moon. I want to show you this quickly because this is where Neil was supposed to set the spacecraft down. All the indications were that was the area. We did not know that that was actually a crater when those photographs were made. If Neil had landed in that crater, we probably would have had our first crew completely stranded on the moon's surface because that thing was about 60 feet deep and it would have probably landed at an angle, and so we probably would not have been able to launch out of that, that crater. So what did he do? He put that spacecraft in a hover position right here, came over here and, and set it down about 100 yards away with 17 seconds of gas in the tank. And guys and gals, that's why you have to have a man or a woman in that spacecraft if you're gonna go somewhere and land on another body in our system. Neil was not the kind of guy that would come here to sign books or have press conference. You know what he wanted to do? He wanted to climb back in the simulator that he used to train to go to the moon. He had spent about an hour in that day, in that particular day, and he would talk me through all the procedures he went through to land that spacecraft on the moon, and he did it in the simulator right out, outside the door. That was the kind of guy he was. We were getting cocky about our flights to the moon, very successful, landing of course, two landings. All of a sudden we have Apollo 13. Big surprise for all of us. And it's one all five left six uh, business. Is that right? We were lucky, very lucky, that that explosion blew out instead of forward. It allows us to save the three astronauts. And what did they do? They basically transfer it into the, the landing craft, the lunar module that they normally would use to land on the moon. They rode that thing up to the moon, circled, did not land, and came home, transferred back into this mother ship, and we got them home safely. That was a huge event for NASA and the space class, space family. You could not uh, hear any more noise than you might have heard when those guys splashed down in mission control. Failure is not an option, was what this gentleman right here uh, said during that time frame. He was, Krantz was the head of that, that particular group, Mission Control. And by the way, you know what the age of Mission Control was that day? 26. Alan Shepard was often asked questions about his career, what he's gonna do next, and so forth. And I have a, a number of these uh, in the book about him. Here we go. Here's the question he had. Yes, Ask him. Have changed over the years from test pilots to scientists. <laughs> <laughs> well, it gives you a chance to give something back. And because I'm the youngest and the best looking and the most articulate of the Mercury astronauts, 
I am the president of the foundation. You understand what we're dealing with. He was quite a guy. Uh, he, he got to fly uh, to the moon, the only Mercury astronaut to fly to the moon, Apollo 14. Of course, he never, never let us forget that, by the way, nor the other guys. And he pulled this off at the very end of his mission. And ladies and gentlemen, we're at the press site. We're in mission control. We have no idea of what is about to happen. Here we go. He's got a golf ball here on the ground. He's got a golf club in one hand. He swings it. That's not true. It went feet, feet, feet. And we have evidence of that because we took pictures and found it. You never knew exactly what those guys were going to do. They wore 370 Earth pounds of stuff to survive on the moon. That's about 70 uh, R pounds. So you. When you get into the one-sixth environment, you can, you can do a lot of stuff because you don't have that weight. They had all sorts of, of things. Uh, they wore a backpack for communications, a cameras, a uh, checklist. Astronauts do not read checklist. We found that out. So what we did, we added little things to the checklist, and guess what? Not, not only did they be, eat their, read their checklist, they read the other guy's checklist. So we finally figured out a way to get their attention while they're on the moon doing their work. And of course, they, they were the Omega watch, the only watch that's been to the moon surface. Tang. They drank Tang inside that helmet because it was, uh, gave them a, a chance to get some liquid and they, it, they would move their head to the right or left get a hold of that nipple, and, and drink Tang. Well, the problem was they had added potassium to the Tang. And ladies and gentlemen, when you consume Tang with potassium, it creates a gas in your body. We got to listen to two astronauts describing their gas problem buttoned up in a spacesuit on the moon 240,000 miles away. It became extremely interesting comments. We basically turned off everything that was coming down from the moon, from those astronauts, because we did not want to go out to the American, Mr. and Mrs. America. But yes, I did learn some new words about gas problems that I had never heard before. We came up uh, with a new product at, at the Splashdown Party. We introduced a new product called the Prune Tank, and that was very popular in our, our crew of astronauts and friends. It was an interesting time when they landed the moon buggy. By the way, that vehicle was designed in this, in this community and built by the Boeing company. A lot of people worked on the rover, the moon rover. They called the astronauts called it the moon buggy. So you see it parked there. And that's a little close-up look. It was an electric-powered vehicle, four-wheel drive. Astronauts loved it. They, in fact, Shepard drove uh, his uh, mission about, no, not Shepard, but Cernan, the last guy to walk on the moon, drove that thing about 25, 26 miles away from their landing site. So it was a real fun vehicle. And here you go, you give an astronaut any kind of a motorized vehicle, what do you have? Well, of course you have a race car driver. Even on the moon, they were trying to drive it wide open. It, it only went up to about 10 plus miles per hour. That's Charlie Duke talking to John Young. So that was the moon buggy race on the moon surface. They had a fun time up there. They did a lot of falling. We had to change some of those comments, by the way, before they went out to the press. And this one was interesting. I was rolling on the moon one day in a very early month of December. Can you imagine what Alan Shepard and Wally Shira said when they heard that Gene Cernan was skipping on the moon? That was an interesting conversation. 
This was a, a most critical part of that mission. And we had never had a chance to see this in all of the moon landings until the very last mission, Apollo 17. That's the landing craft that they landed in on the moon surface. It's a two-stager. You have the landing stage and they have the launch stage. And we have a full-scale version of that right out here in the, in the hangar. In those days, there was no backup system. A lot of people didn't realize it, but these guys were there to stay if that little engine did not function properly. We did not have a rocket at the Cape for ready for backup. There was no way to go to bring them home. They had about three days of consumables available to them in the spacecraft. So they had to depend on that engine functioning properly or they would have been stranded on the moon surface. Here we go. That's Gene Cernan talking. Okay, I'm going to get the pro. 99, proceeded. Three, two, one. There you go. Lift off. No G forces to speak of. Just very slow up, and it comes up to the lunar orbit, and they dock with their buddy, and they come home in this three man spacecraft. Splashdown was a huge visual for us, and that's at the time when we had splashdown parties, we immediately started having our, our fun party because we got them home safely. And that's the 12 astronauts that have walked on the moon the, uh, from 1969 through 1972. Those are the guys that landed on the surface of the moon during that time frame. We kept score. We sent Russia every mission after we had completed a mission. We sent a scorecard to all the newspapers and the magazines in Russia to make sure they knew what the score was, guess what? We never heard a word back from the Russians. In the five decades that we flew Mercury six times, Gemini 10, 15 flights on the Apollo, Apollo Soyuz, and also Skylab, on 135 flights on the space shuttle, you add all of those up, that's almost 900 astronauts were launched on American rockets in the first five decades of our space program. And that's quite an accomplishment we're quite proud of. And Huntsville, Alabama had a lot to do with that during that time frame. Von Braun helped me uh, build this facility that we're in today. We opened in 1970. It was a fun job. Uh, we, we wanted to show America what we had accomplished in space program, what was going on in Huntsville, Alabama. We had all the rockets and so forth there. And of course, Wally came back and he had to ride his spacecraft and play astronaut, and that was an interesting experience that evening. Uh, and that's really where the name came from, Space Cowboy. That night, Wally uh, reminded us that he was a space cowboy, so we began to use that term frequently. And of course, Shepard had to reenact his golf shots on our moon crater, and that was fun to see. So those guys came back, and they helped us a lot uh, give Space Camp credibility. They were here very much. Uh, in the early years. No, these are not homeless people, I promise you not. Uh, these are six of America's heroes. Uh, I think this was a suit that belonged to Wally, and he shared the jacket with John, and they were able to get a little more wear out of it. Look at these sideburns. I can't remember, what do you call those sideburns? Right. And. Look at that jacket, it's just unbelievable. You gotta ad admit, that their wearing apparel improved in about five years as they began to become famous and be seen by the public. Von Braun was a, a great believer in young people. Uh, when he came here, he saw a school group, kinda like some of you guys and gals have been on the Yellow School Bus Tour, and he asked me, what are they doing here? I said, they came as a field, field trip, He'll be here all most of the day. He said, you think they get anything out of this? I said, I do. He said, are they interested in what we have? I said, yes, sir, they are. Uh, they like to look at that spacecraft and uh, walk under that rocket. But I, I think what they really like to do is climb in that spacecraft over there or put on a spacesuit or snack on space food. And you know what he said? He said, we have all kinds of camps in this country. Why not a space camp? And that was the beginning of what you guys and gals enjoyed this week. Space Camp has been live and well for a long time. I think it's got 800,000 plus participants have been in the program. It's alive and well. And we've got some very impressive people as graduates of that program. 
Uh, you'll notice that these three ladies have a Mercury 7 insignia. That means they have flown in space. Uh, and we have three more ladies that have, are training to fly. And finally, finally, we got a guy. Bob Hines finally made the cut. So now we have seven graduates that are truly U.S. astronauts. Some have flown and some will be flying soon. We're very proud of that collection of people. Shepard loved to come back here and talk about uh, space program, his, uh, his experiences, and guess what the question was this day? Who wants to go to Mars? Almost every kid in the, in the space camp graduation has his hand up, and Shepard has his up as well. And here's some comments about the guy. Well, let us suppose uh, some bright young man or young lady uh, comes up and says they want to go into space. What do I tell them? I'll tell them, first of all, you've got to start working right now because so many people want to go into space today, even though the general public is, has accepted space travel as part of their everyday life, even though there perhaps may be some apathy about flying in space in the general public. A lot of youngsters today, boys and girls, still want to go. And they're only going to take the smart ones. They're only going to take the ones who had good grades in school and then after graduation demonstrated in their field of science, whether it's the life sciences or the physical sciences, demonstrated that they're just a little bit above the average. The performers, the people who have accomplished something in school and out of school are the ones that uh, NASA is going to look for. That's true. And it's, it's time for another walk, and this time on Mars. And, and Shepard really believed that, and he taught us to think about that too, to keep that as a target out there, as a goal for us to pr pass on to you guys and gals. Mars is the next mission. And of course, you know, he's already been here. You know who that is, don't you? Matt Damon's already been to Mars. Surely we can go now, right? So we're going to follow him along. So I'm, I'm looking tonight at you guys and gals, and you really are the Mars generation. And that's why we want to keep that dream alive of space travel, so you, you folks have a chance to make that decision. I want to also mention a, a great university in, in Huntsville today called the University of Alabama Huntsville. We call it America's Space University. You know why? You go to school there, you go next door to school in the future. Because the future is right out across the street at Redstone Arsenal. The missile defense people are there. The, vehicle, the people developing the moon rocket, I'm sorry, the Mars rocket, rather, that will go to Mars, and FBI has a, has a think tank. So you have come out of school at UAH and you have an opportunity to work in this community. So take a look at that uh, opportunity because it's, it's a great university. Looking back at those guys, he was the first, they were the bold, the brave ones that stepped up and said, we want to go to the moon. And Shepard told me a story, he said he was not able to sleep the night before he flew to the moon. I can't understand why. The, the guy's just going to ride on that, climb on that rocket, you know, and go to the moon. He gets in a pickup truck, drives out to the pad. In those days, you could do that. And he got on an elevator and started up to the top where he wanted to go to the top of the spacecraft. About halfway up, he saw a light in the compartment. He gets out, sticks his head in there, and the guy working on the rocket that he's going to fly to the moon the next day. He crawls in, introduces himself, finds out that this is a technician that's basically checking over the parts. They talk about the weather, the football, and various things. And the uh, technician said uh, to Shepard, you know how all these parts on this rocket work? Shepard says, no, sir, I've, I, I don't. I've never met anyone that does. He said, well, I'm here tonight to make sure my part works tomorrow morning. And guys and gals, that's how we were able to go to the moon with 12 astronauts who walked on the moon. The men and women that worked in this program got up and reminded themselves, I'm going to make my part work today. And that's the challenge we leave you guys and gals. Make your part work. Great audience. Thank you very much. We're going to take some questions from the audience. So I have a helper, and I, you raise your hand, and we will bring the microphone to you, and you can ask Mr. Buckby 
your questions. You didn't think we faked the whole, faked the whole thing, do you? I hope not. All right, I'm gonna take my first one right here. We have a question, we'll stand up. Oh, you don't, okay. Hold the mic and ask your question. Have you ever went to space? Repeat. I'm sorry? Have you ever went to space? I have not gone to space, but I sure do want to go. I may be too old for that, but keep in mind your opportunities are there. As space travel is going to get real exciting for the future. How was it to meet Neil Armstrong? Did I meet Armstrong? Yes, no, several times. How was it to? How was, like, he was a, first of all, he's a great pilot. He loved flying airplanes, and I think he would have uh, continued to be a pilot if he hadn't had an opportunity to be the, uh, a moonwalker. But yes, he was a very accomplished pilot. Uh, he was looked upon as one of the top pilots in the astronaut corps. And I really think that's why he was selected to be the first commander of our first craft, first craft to land on the moon surface. Okay. How much do your books cost? <laughs> How much what? How much do your books cost? Oh, my book cost. <laughs> I think it sells for twenty nine ninety five. Yeah, yeah, twenty nine ninety five. And that's it's got a. Uh, let me see if I still got that clicker. Uh, I failed to mention that it's got a. Uh, Got his, a DVD in it. You saw all those uh, video clips I ran in the talk. They're on a disc in the book. Uh, there's about 30 of them, and some of those have never been seen by the public before. They belong to a astronauts that I work with. So you're gonna, when you get the book, you're gonna get a whole bunch, about 20 hours, of videos. Sorry, go ahead. You said the G-force on the simulators, um, the actual astronauts did, was 16. What's the G-force on the G-force simulator here? The G-force on the simulators around here? Probably not more than two and a half Gs, as far as I know, unless they've increased them. About two, two and a half Gs. No, you're not going to get 16 Gs uh, in space camp. I, I assure okay. you that. Over here, Mr. Buckby. What gave you the idea to write the book, The Real, Cow the Real Space Cowboys? Well, you know, I, I lived and breathed and worked with these guys for about 25 years. And I really wanted to remind everyone what, what they were like, what they accomplished uh, when no one else had ever uh, climbed on a rocket and flown 240,000 miles away to the moon, land, work on the moon and come back safely. And I just thought that people need to know more about them, uh, their career, how they got into this astronaut program, and also know that they truly believed in the future of this country. And that mean, meaning we can go beyond the moon, we can go to Mars. And, and every one of those guys talked about Mars, every one of them. And they knew someday our country would go to Mars. Do you think that the people that rode with Neil Armstrong were really silly? The people that with Neil Armstrong were what? Really silly. Silly? Uh, it was pretty serious stuff, flying to the moon and back. Uh, they, they were, when they got into that business, they were serious. When they were home, uh, fooling around, they, they, they had fun. Uh, you know, they played golf, volleyball, all sorts of sports and so forth. But when it came time to suit up, uh, it was a whole other world for them. And basically, they concentrated on what they were do, supposed to do to make that spacecraft uh, fly to the moon and back safely. I wanted to ask, how was it working alongside the guy who used to run NASA? How'd they get along with the engineers and people they worked at NASA? How was it working alongside the guy who used to run NASA with you? Dr. Von Braun? Mm -hmm. How was it working with Dr. Von Braun? Oh, Dr. Von Braun. Well, it was, it was a huge you know, opportunity for us. Uh, not only was, a, was he a great engineer, but he, he had a vision for the future. And he shared that with us. And he motivated us to want to be a part 
of the moon landing program. Uh, he was a forward-looking individual, talked about and looked to the future all the time, never satisfied with what we were going, doing today or what we had just accomplished. So he, he really kind of developed a, a, you might say, a map of space travel for us, and he convinced us, first of all, that we could do all of this because in the early years when we were just young and just starting out, we had no idea that we truly could build a rocket and fly it to the moon. He, he had that ability to convince us that we as a team could do it. And there was 400,000 men and women in this country that worked on the Apollo program. From the moon rockets to the moon buggies, it was a huge effort. And we went from zero to the moon in eight years in this country. And that was quite an accomplishment for that achievement. And by the way, guys and gals, you must know, nobody has been out of Earth orbit but Americans. And certainly, nobody's been to the moon except American astronauts. Who was the first astronaut you met? Who was the, well, <clears throat> the one I spent the most time with was Wally, Sh I'm sorry, <clears throat> Alan Shepard's the one that I kind of looked upon as, as my buddy, and we, we spent a lot of time together. But I, I, I tell you, all of them were interesting guys, and uh, they, they truly believed in what we were doing. <clears throat> they were truly American-oriented guys that believed this country had tremendous capabilities, and they had a chance to apply some of that uh, to get to the moon and back. But yeah, they were, they were fun around. Uh, they, they also were uh, party people uh, after hours, after work. Uh, we, we found that out, too. Uh, they enjoyed themselves, but uh, they, they, were, they were seriously about space flight. They really were. Um, why did they leave like part of the spacecraft on the moon from the Apollo missions? Why did they leave the spacecraft on the moon? We didn't really need to bring back the lander. Uh, there are six landing stages on the moon as we speak. And by the way, we have pictures of those that we've taken from high resolution cameras. We know they're all still there. Nobody else has gone and, and picked them up and hauled them home or whatever. So they had to leave that as, that was kind of their launch pad. And you saw the picture. Uh, they launched in the cabin, the top side of the spacecraft, and they used the landing stage as their platform or their launch pad. So there are six of those uh, on the moon uh, next to a, the American flag that are also there. And all the parts and pieces, three moon buggies are up there, uh, parked not far away. In fact, that camera you saw, that picture taken of that liftoff was from one of, the, one of the moon buggies' cameras that we activated and operated from Houston. We watched them lift off. That was the last time we had astronauts on the moon surface. Okay, over here, Mr. Buckner. How old were you when you built the, when you created Space Camp? How old was I? <clears throat> Let's see, 30, 31, 32, 31. I'd worked at NASA for about 10 years and came here at the, about, was I think it was 31. How, how did you, how did y'all convert pilots to astronauts? That's a good question. How did we convert pilots to astronauts? You know, uh, they, uh, one thing about the pilot and the astronaut, uh, they, they both were very much engaged in being able to successfully fly a, an airplane or a spacecraft. They all wanted to be the commander, by the way, and you could only have one commander in each spacecraft. But they, they converted very easily to becoming astronauts. Uh, I think they, they learned that they were going to have to pay more attention to m the mission statement, uh, th the plan to fly there and back. A, a, a fighter pilot could be on pretty much on his own. Once he got off the ground, he could fly pretty well however he wanted. <clears throat> That's not true with an astronaut. You were listening to mission control, and you were following mission control's directions from the time you lifted off until you returned. And so they, they found that out right early on, especially Shepard and Shara, because they were not accustomed to having people talk to them and tell them what they were supposed to do, the whole mission. So uh, mission control was very much engaged in all these missions. 
They knew exactly where those guys were. They could hear them talking, and so they knew the condition of the astronauts. That was, that was important, too, to know, because you never knew when one of those guys might become ill or something. We didn't have any, any real problems except Apollo 13. It got so cold on board because they couldn't run the heating system for three guys in that spacecraft that they had to bundle up and everything they could wrap around them. And one guy got a, a really bad cold. So uh, it was very much a part of the mission to hear the mission control people giving them instructions. Right here. How old were you when you started working with Dr. Von Brown? How old was I when I came here? Oh, when I started working with Von Brown, uh, I was 23. 23 at NASA. That's when I, I left. The, I was here in the Army first. I was an officer in the missile program. I left the Army and went to work at NASA and worked there for about 10 years and then came here. When the astronauts came back to um, off, did they get badges or like medals for going up to space? Did they get stuff like badges and medals? Yes, yeah. when they came back from the moon. They were honored all over the world. They made world tours. We would go with them to various places around the world. They would be honored by prime ministers, uh, by other countries. And yes, they were honored with medals and so forth. And all those guys have those medals. And some of that material now is in, in the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian. Your Hello, Mr. Mr. Buckby. I'd like to know in our preparation to going to Mars, uh, we'll be, I believe, stopping over at the moon first. How do you propose or how do you envision us with our return to the moon? Are we going to the area of the original landing sites, or are we going to exploit new areas on the moon to like uh, develop the helium-3 uh, development and things like that? If, if they do have the moon stopover, I would imagine it will be an entirely different site <clears throat> because they may decide that it's a better position uh, on the moon to launch from the moon to Mars. So that'll be a decision made by, by the flight crews, but I'm sure it's not likely to be one of the old sites. Uh, I would be surprised that it, it, it would be there. I think you'll see a new, new flight. And of course, uh, that plan is, is being discussed, but you know, the, the serious thing that's, that must happen is NASA mm. must be given a mission with a deadline to go to Mars. If they do not get a deadline and a specific mission from the President and the Congress, they will constantly, slowly go forward and you will never get there. And that was so important for Kennedy to give us a, a date, a, a mission, and where and when we were supposed to do it. And we delivered that mission within eight years. NASA performs much better when they have a specific mission and a time frame. And remember, remember that NASA must be given a time frame for a mission like that. Mr. Buckby, we have time for one more question, and we're going to um, ask it right here. Um, are there any uh, special requirements to become an astronaut like today? Any what about becoming an astronaut? Special requirements. Special requirements? Uh, basically, uh, it's wide open compared to the old days. You know, you had to be a fighter pilot. Today, that's not true. They have probably as many scientists, astronauts in the, in the program as they do pilots. In fact, the pilots are small in number. Uh, they're looking for people not just... Uh, engineers, they're looking for scientists who have a specific skill that wish to, they, they wish to take into space and develop that particular subject matter to advance it or whatever. So you see a, a, a lot of different kinds of qualified people uh, in the astronaut corps. And it's continuing to grow, by the way. They added about six not long ago. They're going to be adding some more in the next few years. And as soon as this Mars thing gets figured out and time frame set, you're going to see more and more astronauts selected. Female, male, about 50-50 today. All right. Well, that concludes our question and answer. I know we have Space Camp that needs to get back to their missions. I'm going to ask that we give a round of applause for our speaker tonight. Thank you. I'll see all of you in space. <laughs> and I want to thank everyone for coming out.
Please continue to watch our uh, calendar online for more Pass the Torch lectures. I think, uh, I think we all learned a little bit about the, the um, early historic astronauts.